So we're back with Public Square, and Rinaldo, you really wanted to say something. So I want to go to you to pick up on your thought. There's a quote, and, um, and I use this quite a bit when I'm working with um, Native American families. And um, within that quote, it says that a great warrior is known by the many battle scars that they have on them. And so with families, I'm like, everything that you've been through is, is signifying that you've overcome and that you are a warrior, and you're great on top of that. So I wanted to ask Dr. Davis, because you're dealing with kids in the juvenile justice system who come through a lot, presumably because now they're in the juvenile justice system. Is that idea also part of trauma-informed care to give them a sense of their strengths? Many of the uh, children that are in the delinquent system are very skilled at, at survival, and uh, so much so that it's, it's frightening how, how, how good they are at it. And yet, you know, converting that into socialized kinds of skills and um, vocational kinds of skills is part of our larger picture of trauma-informed care. There's lots of different kinds of trauma. And the, the kind of trauma that oftentimes gets discussed is PTSD, because we're most familiar with that. And it's easier to identify, and it's a common term. Um, but really, the kind of trauma we see in child services, especially uh, children have been in Child Protective Services uh, or who were in juvenile justice is trauma that happened during the first year, three years, five years. Uh, and those kind of traumas are pre-verbal uh, and they affect uh, the sort of things that Dr. Sabu was talking about, about regulatory kinds of capacities, the ability to regulate their moods, to regulate their behavior, to even make attachments uh, are formed during those years. So then what can happen in terms of resiliency? And it, uh, um, resiliency is always possible, but it's usually, like, you know, like you were saying, Bill, it's, it's usually based upon um, relationships of some kind or another. If it's not the original caretaker relationship, it's going to be a relationship with somebody else. But most of that resilience comes from the processing or uh, the reworking of that trauma in a, in a relationship where there's trust and security and some sort of duration. Mm -hmm. And so, a Andy, I know you're working with Dr. Davis and with Yael on a, this project that's drawing correlations between ACEs, <laughs> early childhood experiences, incarceration. What are the connections there and what can we do about them? Well, Megan, I, th I think the striking thing to me is, um, is work that's been done looking at brains that have had uh, impact from uh, adverse child experiences and showing that um, there are possibilities for re-regulation and for um, improvement and recovery of those brains. The thing that we look at with kids who are coming through the juvenile justice system um, is that they are often parents as well, and we think that one of the things that we can improve and help with is helping form those relationships with their young children and improving their capacity to be parents in ways that form those important, uh, deeply felt uh, connections with another human being. What they want for their children is no different than any of us. They, they want their children to be successful, to, to be able to function in society, to complete an education, to have good relationships. And if we can use the event of their being a parent as part of that recovery process and embrace them in their need to have safety and good behavioral health and, and medical care and good legal support, then I think we have a chance in, in helping move their path to a different place. So one of the things that's always really fun is, is, um, is I ask them what they want for their children. They say, well, I want to see my kid graduate from high school. Great. We know graduating from high school is going to make such a difference in long-term health and productivity. And then, and then what I find my, myself asking them is, so what do we have to do to get there? And then, what do we have to do to make sure you're there when your kid walks across the platform? Right. So, so you know, we are not going to achieve the goals we want if you die of an overdose, if, if you are killed in, in a violent episode. And, and so it gives us both the chance to sit and pause and go, okay, here's the work. 
when you're talking about the changes in how you do trauma-informed care, it just seems like this huge systemic change to so many things. It's almost anything that intersects with a family or a child. What does that mean in terms of, of policy? So from a policy perspective, I think our state has a number of challenges. One is to continue with the great work that Dr. Davis and others are doing to make sure that our sort of back-end crisis-oriented CYFD systems are well trauma-informed. But perhaps our even bigger challenge is thinking about how we create a statewide trauma-informed system of early childhood behavioral health care. This year, the task force, um, which I'm privileged to co-chair, is currently recommending um, looking at the Medicaid system, since Medicaid really is the backbone of our healthcare system in our state, 80% of our kids in New Mexico are born um, Medicaid eligible and have access um, theoretically to really great screening um, that would include looking at the mental health and social emotional needs of children from a very early age when they go into the doctor for mm -hmm. a, um, a Medicaid related appointment and also um, could mean um, if we changed our policy structure a little bit, um, more access to services based on risk as opposed to later when families are already in crisis. Andy, you're working on this idea that um, kids coming out of the juvenile justice system also have some of these supports in place to help them continue to succeed. Maybe they didn't have when they were kids. Yeah, Megan, you know, I think we're, we're looking at kids coming out of the for example, the Bernalillo County Youth Services Center. And Dr. Davis's uh, work and the work we're doing, looking at the number of adverse experiences these young people have accumulated by the time they're coming out would suggest we have to have four things definitely in place. There has to be substance abuse treatment available. They have to have access to that. Because even if they are not acutely feeling the effects of substance use disorder, they're going to encounter the triggers that will get them into trouble again with that. We need to have a model that's going to work. We need to have a trauma-informed juvenile justice system that sees these kids as having had these tremendously negative pre-verbal events going on in their lives for which they got almost no help. And now we're going to try to reverse some of those trauma events, but they can't be done under the auspices of continued punitive um, approaches. The third thing we have to do is we have to address chronic health conditions. So a lot of these individuals uh, have overweight and obesity issues. They're at tremendous risk of having problems with diabetes later in life. And we have to begin to pro project the transition from youth services to adult services, from youth mental health to adult psychiatry. And that transition is a rough road. I mean, there, there's like, you know, a huge a Grand Canyon of potential gap for them. Oh, really? Why oh. is that? I oh, it's. Okay. Well, I, I think it's because of the way that, partly it's because of the way reimbursement works. It's partly the way that we view adults versus viewing young people. And lastly, there has to be modifications in the educational system. Well, I was going to ask that. And we did have um, Albuquerque Public Schools was going to join us today. Leslie Kelly uh, could not. She had a, a personal emergency, I think, come up. They are getting some training, I think, Raven, correct? Correct, we've uh, currently done uh, training with all the Albuquerque Public School social workers and counselors in trauma-informed care, which really, I wanna highlight, involves kind of two essential elements. First, working with um, kind of all child-serving professionals, so working across all levels of a system to um, kind of help those professionals have more successful relationships with traumatized youth and families. So coming from a place of, of understanding rather than a punitive approach, understanding what is likely to trigger or re-traumatize a youth and working to avoid that. Um, but really importantly, the other essential element is supporting all child-serving professionals in um, understanding and identifying their own risk of secondary traumatic stress. Because exposure. they're working with people who have trauma. That's right. It's a reality of the work um, to experience that secondary trauma, um, which can play out in similar ways as a youth with post-traumatic stress symptoms. Um, and in addition, burnout. Um, so secondary traumatic stress and burnout are, are really kind of pitfalls of the work that we all need to be warded against um, and supported by our organizations for how to move towards self-care and wellness across the whole system. Teachers are under a lot of stress these days and they have kids coming in with these enormous problems. So you can train them in that, but then what happens? Then it's a matter of 
not just calling in the school resource officer when he's acting out? That's or, right. Okay. Um, our, our next uh, emphasis with Albuquerque Public Schools is training teachers and kind of all frontline staff in um, simple strategies to work with a youth who is triggered or re-traumatized in the classroom so that maybe they can feel a greater sense of efficacy in their work, um, increase understanding for the youth, and that they're better keyed into the supports in their own kind of school building and system that they can reach out to. One of the things that I've been really reflecting on in terms of the systematic change that needs to take place is our expectations of our workforce. One of the approaches that we use at our clinic is, is really to emphasize the, the team effort and not to work um, individually but to, to have supports around us so that we don't necessarily feel alone in the work that we're doing and that as a therapist we're not isolated ourselves have, and having to contain that sense of helplessness or hopelessness um, that the families are, will transmit to us. I think that's a really good point in terms of you know the silos that are existing within our own organizations in terms of you know clinicians, administrators, but also as a symptom of you know something that needs to change within the larger um, system of care for young children in terms of the silos that exist between behavioral health, education, juvenile justice, and seeing ourselves as separate entities when we really need to be working together to wrap around families to work on the prevention efforts. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think this also you know leads us to. A really necessary conversation about the workforce crisis that we um, are experiencing in New Mexico and yes we have this incredible training and opportunities and unfortunately you know we have no staff that are able to reach out in rural and frontier communities to meet the need. Do you have a sense that this idea of you have to understand trauma and that informs everything else policy and practices is this is this making its way to our policymakers? I think it's one of these emerging ideas uh, that has a lot of translational difficulty. Um, the concept of adverse childhood experiences, for example, or social determinants, are viewed by some people as a fixed deficit. It's like losing a spleen or something. Oh, really? You like you're back. just never going to overcome yeah, that? you never overcome it. And therefore, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be in this sort of underclass situation. Resilience might be a feature everybody has. And if we do the right work together, we're able to nurture it and grow it. But it needs to be a conversation that everybody becomes engaged with. And we don't get fixed in the idea that, that certain people have it and some people don't. And we're only going to help those people who do. The legislature. I think it, because they keep viewing themselves as being resource limited, mm -hmm. tends to be an inhibitor of being able to think about things. Because any time ideas come up, the tendency is to say, we won't have enough money. Well, the you know, natural resources, the price of oil is down. We can't do anything. And I, and I think the, the limitation is that they're, in some ch cases, really defending silos of influence and silos of, of personal interest. Uh, and not opening doors to a larger conversation. I think that is the most dangerous limitation that we're looking at in the policy realm. So the, the, the scarcity mindset. Yeah. So how do you, how do you overcome that? Yeah, and the, and the depth of the challenge. I mean, you know, many of these families, it's not just, um, you know, the trauma of these adverse childhood experiences, but sort of day-to-day crisis. Um, and so I think one thing that um, interested the legislator in our um, conversation recently was um, sort of the multi-generational, multidisciplinary um, approach that some of us are trying to take to um, address these issues. So there are... So um, sort of like when Kendra is with her son in CLN kids learning together right. how to self-regulate or how to play or right <laughs> right and so um, Dr. Shee's focus program for example is a place where um, when um, a child with uh, very high needs given um, they're having been born with a positive drug toxicology comes into the doctor's office they get to be seen not just alone but with whoever their caregiver is and then linking up with um, the educational approach by providing early intervention services in the home that will hopefully prevent um, the kids from having more intensive special education um, and other needs later. And then Dr. Shi also had the foresight to um, bring the law school onto the treatment team um, in thinking about the more immediate crisis level needs that some of these families have. I think there are some um, examples of positive solutions out there. How do you see CYFD fitting in? 
um, to sort of this conversation? CYFD, I mean, of, I think what we recognize is that almost all the kids who are in any kind of mental health care or those that are in, uh, also in other services like special education services, most of those kids um, are there with some relationship to trauma. See, I think it's an emerging consensus uh, that we have that trauma is driving most of our social deficits. Um, but I think translating like Dr. Shi was saying, making that uh, into policy and making that even into treatment modalities uh, is a difficult task. I would not be surprised if everyone here has a slightly different interpretation of what trauma-informed care means. A very important point is, is the degree of the exposure to, okay. to stress. So stress is part of life. It's, it's, it's in many ways, it serves us well. It gives us survival skills. It's when we're exposed to an exaggerated level of, st of stress that becomes a trauma, it becomes toxic trauma, and then that derails the, all the other systems. Mm -hmm. So we have to re-educate, re create new neuropaths to have uh, healthier responses. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you have to be very careful about making comparisons about who comes out well and who doesn't come out well. Um, because, you know, I could go into a training program and I'll never be a halfback for the Chicago Bears, right? <laughs> that's just because that's not who I am. And it could be the best physical training program that exists, but that's not in my makeup. Um, and so an outcome for, a well outcome for one person um, may be very, very different than a well outcome um, for another person given a different set of circumstances. So what, in, with those in mind, what are the next steps that we need to take to make people more informed about trauma or to make systems more responsive? So I think one part of that is, is to begin to say trauma-informed resilience enhancing models of care that we try to take do those simultaneously I think another way of looking at this is is that we don't look at an individual who's experienced trauma in isolation and and with kids and young people begin to figure out how do we wrap ourselves around the entire family system so that in our programs and the focus programs sometimes we're seeing three generations we're seeing the child who had prenatal exposure and we're seeing the older siblings who are also having school problems um, and then we make a commitment to trying to integrate our systems to, to say, where is it that we can share information and not get stuck with these barriers about information sharing? I am so fortunate to work with some of the kids I take care of. Dr. Sabu also takes care of. And boy, the difference it makes to know that I have that backup. And when I call the school and say, well, you know, I'm, Dr. Sabu and I are thinking that this is how it ought to go. And the school's going, oh, well, great. We're so happy to hear the kid has a primary care doctor. And these are the kinds of potentials that are there, but we have to, to some degree, create systems that facilitate making those communications happen as opposed to blocking them. I think, you know, it, to emphasize what Dr. Shi just said, it's the flexibility of the system to actually um, include the entire family in that kind of care, and that takes flexible funding. Oh, okay. um, like, as long as funding is designated as one diagnosis and mm -hmm. one charge, um, I think we're going to be locked into a uh, a very inflexible way of addressing the, the needs of the, of the family. Uh, really, resilience comes from uh, the strength of the uh, primary relationship that that child has uh, and almost any kind of assistance, you know, the, the, whether it's medical care or legal care or psychiatric care, any of that uh, contributes uh, to the relational strength that that child experiences. I just, well. wanted, I just wanted to share a story. Um, I have my parents were um, both in boarding school, and my my father was um, brutally beaten. His you know his hair cut off, and he couldn't speak his language. And then my mother went to a Christian boarding school at age six. And then um, when we were born, um, I was very grateful that you know my parents were in the home, and I wasn't taken away. But their relating with me as a child was very difficult in how to be a parent and how to, how to uh, make sure we were getting our physical needs and emotional needs and the care we needed. And so um, there was um, any time um, we, we would get our parents upset um, instead of you know how parents would say, um, the boogeyman's gonna get you or do all this stuff. My, my mom and my dad, my mom predominantly would always say, if you don't listen to me, 
and you don't want you know, to, to hear what I'm saying, I will send you to boarding school. Mm -hmm. So that was the fear tactic. Mm -hmm. We were like, whoa, <laughs> boarding school. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's one of these things where the trauma and what exists, and then we would, we would laugh about it. But then we would think about it too. Um, boarding school was not something that my parents, you know, they had to endure, and it was brutal on them. The last year or so have seen um, some very high profile stories about kids who have committed crimes, some violent crimes and even murder. Um, and there's been a, a spate of violent crime in Albuquerque and there's a real push now for punitive measures of some kind on these kids. And um, so I guess my question is how do you approach lawmakers and policymakers who want to push for that. If we could say what happened to these kids and why are they doing this? You know, and, and if we had been able to intervene when they were younger, when they were infants in their first five years of life, we would be looking at an incredibly different world. You know, it's a hard sell when, you know, then you're going to get accused by your opponents. Yeah. Or... And containment, you know, and control of delinquency isn't necessarily the same thing always as uh, punitive mm -hmm. uh, interventions and Absolutely. so I think that line has to be found because control is a good thing mm -hmm. um, but the punitive sort of uh, infliction of unnecessarily strenuous kinds of consequences um, doesn't itself solve the problem. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, the problem goes a lot farther back. I think it's also really about understanding our juvenile justice population and who are some of these really serious offenders in our state. So Dr. Davis, Dr. She and I are doing research in partnership with CYFD and the New Mexico Sentencing Commission looking at the adverse childhood experiences and trauma and related mental health and substance abuse needs of our most serious offenders in, the, in our juvenile justice system in New Mexico and we are finding astonishingly high rates of trauma, way higher than the general population among these children. I mean the adverse childhood experiences studies really um, draw the line kind of at children who have four more adverse childhood experiences as um, ha being likely to have very difficult outcomes in life. But the kids who are um, involved in our juvenile justice system at the highest end in New Mexico have six, seven, eight very serious adverse childhood experiences of trauma in their early childhood. And so the questions that we can ask ourselves are, you know, how can we really intervene earlier? Within the area of special education, I think we really look, have to look at our behavior intervention plans and also these functional assessments that we're doing for kids to get behavior intervention plans and how that should be sort of a stoplight and asking, okay, these kids are having disciplinary issues and we want to use this plan, but how are we using it effectively? So I think that um, all the information that we had over the last years from uh, brain development, from social determinants of health, toxic trauma, all of this is coming together to help us understand the importance of uh, acting very early, so through screening, through uh, working with parents and children and the generations that are, that are involved, and how this is impacting communities. So it is a collaborative work. It is, I think, a cultural change. Uh, I think we can go through training, but if we don't think about the, how we need to view these this challenges differently, uh, we'll just keep doing the same thing. Again, the system um, is such that um, it rewards a different types of uh, work. And uh, it was mentioned that in, in the medical office, we have the opportunity to, to change that, but it, it's radical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to thank you all for coming and talking about this. I know it's very complicated, and I appreciate you offering your, your insights and your practical experience to talk about it. And please feel free to stay around and chat afterwards.